everyone, and welcome back to the FAI Wire. My name is Gabe Caligiuri, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll jump right into it because we have a couple of urgent updates for you coming from Iran and Israel uh, that have been taking place over the past few days. But first, we wanted to give you a brief recap and update on what's happening with earthquake relief in southwestern Turkey and also in northwestern Syria. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know by now, there was a series of major earthquakes in southwestern Turkey beginning on February 6th of this year, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake, uh, followed shortly thereafter by an aftershock that was almost as powerful, uh, devastating 10 provinces of southern Turkey, about 14 million Turks affected by this event, about 16% of the population. Uh, earthquakes obviously rippled across the border into northwest Syria, affecting several provinces there, including Idlib province, which is the last remaining rebel holdout of the Syrian civil war. Um, difficult to know for sure what the death toll in both places has been, but so far at least 50,000 dead in southwestern, in southwestern Turkey, excuse me, and at least another 7,200 dead in northwestern Syria, although those numbers are probably very low due to underreporting by the Syrian regime and rebel groups. Uh, two weeks later, there was another major aftershock, 6.3 on the Richter scale near the biblical city of Antioch. Um, modern Hayday province only exacerbated the damage caused by the original earthquakes uh, more structures collapsed, higher death tolls and injury, toll, injury tolls from that event. Um, over half of the structures in modern Antioch are either collapsed into rubble or seriously damaged. Across both Syria and Turkey, over 230,000 structures collapsed. Uh, the worst earthquake in Turkey since 1939, since before World War II. Uh, now, as rescue and relief efforts wind down and um, search and, recu uh, sir, search and refu uh, I'm sorry, rescue is coming to a close, um, the ongoing relief efforts have spun up and will be continuing uh, for the foreseeable future, probably for years to come. About 2.5 million people, both in Turkey and Syria, are displaced. They don't have homes, they're living in tents. Uh, including about 850,000 children. Uh, Syria was already one of the world's worst humanitarian crises before the earthquakes due to the decade-long Syrian civil war. Already millions of people internally displaced, uh, displaced inside Syria and millions more uh, refugees outside of Syria. So the earthquake has only added an extra layer of suffering on top of that. Um, obviously, there are ongoing physical needs uh, for medical care. For example, over 350,000 Turkish women are pregnant in affected uh, areas of the earthquake zone and in need of prenatal care. Uh, makeshift hospitals have uh, popped up all over southern Syria, but the local government and even the Turkish government is completely overwhelmed and unable to uh, provide services as needed. Um, and the earthquakes have not only created a lot of physical damage and uh, medical uh, damage, but also emotional and psychological damage for survivors as well. Um, interviews with survivors uh, conducted by media in the week since the attacks show uh, the ongoing fallout and the need for uh, mental health care in, in Turkey in the wake of the earthquakes. For instance, um, this is just one example. Uh, one woman, a 23-year-old uh, survivor of the earthquake, uh, told local journalists that she refuses to go back to her home, even though it didn't collapse. She refuses to re-enter it, saying, quote, the moment I enter the house, I'm afraid that everything will happen again. The area around our house has become a place full of debris, surrounding schools, market buildings, None of them exist anymore. It looks like a place in horror movies. Uh, another interview with a man, a Turkish man who works with children, uh, he had to say, I met a group of children and they mentioned that they were afraid of the darkness. They cannot sleep. What they see, that is, the bodies of their friends and their parents, they will always think about that. So obviously, 
uh, the fallout of these earthquakes extends far beyond just the death toll and the injury toll um, into the lives of the survivors uh, for months and years to come. And the same man said, we need the international community to step up again so that we can increase the number of our safe spaces and our programming to ensure children of all backgrounds have a safe space to start recovering. So obviously, um, along with the catastrophe and the suffering, take, suffering taking place in southern Turkey right now, there's also wide effectual doors for gospel labor. So that's always the double-edged sword of catastrophe is human suffering on one side, but also wide effectual doors and opportunities uh, for the hope and, and good news of the gospel on the other side. So we would ask everyone to please continue to pray uh, for the people of Turkey and Syria. Uh, we pray that the Father would send laborers into that harvest field. Uh, we need all kinds of laborers there right now, uh, medical, um, mental health professionals, uh, construction workers. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities for uh, people to bring good news to the people of Turkey and meet not only physical needs and, and, and spiritual needs, emotional needs, but also um, the need, their need for the gospel there. If you feel led to do so, uh, FAI still has our ongoing earthquake relief campaign going on. Um, if you have the FAI app on the home screen, there is a tile called Earthquake Response, so you can click on that to give, or you can go to our giving page, which is faimission.givingfuel.com slash earthquake dash response, and we'll have it up on the screen for you there. Next, um, a little bit more pressing this week has been the um, ongoing trend of chemical attacks against uh, schoolgirls in Iran. Uh, two more mysterious poisonings reported last week on Tuesday, April 4th. 20 girls were hospitalized in the city of Tabriz, uh, followed by even more hospitalizations in the city of Sarvistan in southwestern Iran on Wednesday the 5th. So two days in a row, um, an additional two or three dozen young girls mysteriously exhibiting symptoms of chemical poisoning rushed to the hospital. Amateur video was uploaded uh, to social media, for instance, showing a distraught mother uh, with her daughter on a hospital gurney in the hospital, um, showing the, the devastating fallout of those attacks, of which there have been over 270 in the last six months affecting anywhere between 1,700 and maybe as many as 7,000 girls all across Iran in as many as 140 cities. So this is a very widespread phenomenon. Uh, the Iranian government claims that it's continuing to investigate. However, as we discussed in a previous edition of The Wire, um, there's no way that there's any other organization besides the Iranian regime that could carry out such a widespread and coordinated campaign, and they certainly have the means, motive, and opportunity to do so. Case in point, um, the latest attack came after Iran's Supreme Leader, Grand Ayatollah Khomeini, came on uh, state TV and announced that women who refuse to wear the hijab, that is the Islamic head covering, are committing an act of what he called political haram. Haram, as you might know, is the act of breaking the law of Allah as it's prescribed in the Quran. So both, in a sense, they're, they're breaking political and, as he would say, religious law by not wearing their hijabs properly. Um, Iran's judiciary chief also was quoted in Iranian state media on April 1st, so just a few days before the latest rounds of attack, as saying that women who are not wearing the, the hijab would be, quote, punished and prosecuted without mercy. And now we can see that more than six months after the beating death of uh, Masha Amani, the Kurdish Iranian woman who was not wearing her hijab correctly in Tehran and who was beaten to death by Iranian morality police, the Basiji, uh, which kicked off the, the latest round of street protests in Iran, we can see that despite the, the popular uprising and millions of Iranians in the street across every sector of society, across every city, in Iran, 
the Iranian regime still refuses to budge an inch on, the, on this issue. Related to protests, also on Wednesday the 5th, a large uh, street protest gathered in the capital of Tehran on the anniversary of the murder by the Iranian regime of a well-known protester uh, who was underage when he was killed. Uh, the crowd was recorded uh, with amateur video chanting, we don't want a child killing regime. And they're speaking on behalf of over, the, uh, over 70 children who have been murdered by the Iranian regime since protests started last September. In all, 500 people have been killed in the streets or in custody by the regime, most of them peaceful protesters, over 22,000 people uh, have been arrested, most of them still detained and in custody. Many of those are children. So as always, we would ask you to continue to pray for the people of Iran and especially pray for our brothers and sisters uh, in the underground Iranian church who are risking their lives every day to reach people with the good news of Jesus and make disciples in that country. Uh, last but certainly not least, a very important update, as many of you probably know, uh, there has been another round of rocket fire in Israel over the last two to three days as of the recording of this video on Friday, April 7th. Um, this time, both in southern Israel around the Gaza Strip, which has unfortunately been a typical occurrence that happens every few months, but uncharacteristic of the last decade or so, there was a major um, rocket launch over the Lebanese border into northern Israel, into the Galilee region. Uh, this began uh, last Tuesday, April 4th, on the Temple Mount. As many of you know, it's Ramadan season, which is already a heightened uh, season of tension between Palestinians and Israelis, especially Israeli security and religious Israelis in Jerusalem. Um, the Palestinian militant factions and uh, extreme radical clerics uh, that work and preach on the Al-Aqsa, uh, on the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Mosque have been threatening the Israelis with violence if, if the Israelis do anything to desecrate the Temple Mount um, during the Passover season, which is also occurring this weekend. And last week, this all came to a head on uh, Wednesday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday the 4th, right after daily prayer services in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, just as uh, worshipers were leaving the mosque, a large mob, you could say, of young Palestinian men uh, came up onto the Temple Mount platform, went into the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and barricaded themselves inside. Um, there were still some uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian worshipers inside the mosque at the time, they were trapped inside, and um, the mob refused to let them go. Uh, so they were unwilling participants in this event. Um, after barricading themselves inside of the mosque, they began to light off fireworks inside the mosque, uh, which is full of wood and carpet and other flammable material. Um, began recording this event with their cell phone videos, uploading it to social media. So there's all kinds of evidence of what was going on in the mosque at the time. Obviously, fireworks are considered explosives, and um, the rioters, we can call them, knew that doing this, setting off fireworks inside the mosque, would provoke a response from Israeli security, specifically the Israeli border guard, which acts as the police force of the Temple Mount and, East, and uh, the old city of Jerusalem. So, of course, um, the Israeli authorities had to respond. Uh, they forcefully entered the mosque, and then there were some physical altercations between Israeli security and the rioters when uh, they attempted to arrest them. A video was taken of this event, uploaded to social media, and uh, framed as if uh, they were peaceful worshipers who were being uh, brutally assaulted by Israeli security forces. Uh, this went all throughout uh, anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli news channels, was retweeted by a certain U.S. congresswoman, who I won't name, and made its way across the world media. Um, obviously, this is the exact effect that um, 
this group of individuals wanted to provoke. But on top of that, they wanted to set a pretext for what would come next. And that is uh, the condemnation of Israeli aggression, quote unquote, uh, by Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the Iranian regime and Lebanese Hezbollah and the other pro-Iranian proxy forces across the Middle East um, who then took action. Uh, on the morning of Thursday, April 6th, uh, Palestinian militant factions in southern Lebanon fired 34 rockets into the upper Galilee region of Israel. Uh, most of those rockets were intercepted by the Iron Dome um, missile or anti-missile system. And a few fell into either open fields. Uh, one fell, ironically, into a, a Christian Israeli Arab neighborhood and damaged a house and injured someone. But otherwise, very little damage was caused uh, by the rocket fire. Two rockets were fired also into the uh, Israeli community of Metula, which is the northernmost city uh, inside of Israel proper in what's called the Finger of the Galilee, kind of the central Galilee region, right on the border of Lebanon, has been a flashpoint several times for conflict um, between Israelis and Palestinians and Lebanese Hezbollah. Um, again, no damage caused. However, this was the first time since the second Israeli-Lebanese war in 2006, that there has been such a uh, large cross-border uh, rocket fire from southern Lebanon into um, northern Israel. So in the last 17 years, there are several Palestinian factions, militant factions in southern Lebanon uh, Palestinian militants have been in southern Lebanon since they were kicked out of Jordan in 1970. Uh, Hamas is now there as well. Um, they are not necessarily the guests of the Lebanese government, uh, but they are the guests of Lebanese Hezbollah, which effectively controls southern Lebanon in the Shia majority part of, of that country. Um, and they're, they are... Um, I would say probably on a leash there with Hezbollah, but given a certain amount of impunity. Um, so there have been several incidents of rocket fire across the border, but it's just been onesies, twosies. This is the first incident of multiple rockets, dozens of rockets going across the Lebanese border into Northern Israel uh, in almost two decades. So obviously this is something that could not have happened without the direct approval of uh, Hezbollah chairman Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, he must have not only approved this, but coordinated with the, uh, the Palestinian factions that fired these missiles. Uh, nonetheless, Hamas uh, took credit for this on their media channels, and the IDF responded the very next day, the Thursday night, and um, uh, also Friday morning. Airstrikes were conducted in southern Lebanon, so several airstrikes south of the, the major city, uh, Lebanese city of Tyre in what is referred to as a Palestinian refugee camp is actually a neighborhood has been an established neighborhood of Palestinians um, since the first Arab-Israeli war in the 1940s. Nonetheless, is still referred to as a refugee camp and is a hotbed of Palestinian refugee or Palestinian militant activity. Um, so that certain positions in that camp were shelled uh, by Israeli tanks. Uh, there were also airstrikes conducted in the Gaza Strip against Hamas targets there uh, by Israeli aircraft uh, Thursday night, Friday morning. Um, Hamas responded to the airstrikes in Gaza by firing more rockets, this time from the Gaza Strip into southern Israel. Over 44 rockets were fired. Again, most of them intercepted by the Iron Dome um, defense system. A few of them got through, one of them striking a family home in the community of Sterot, causing some damage. Uh, so far, as of the taping of this uh, video, there's no uh, further action being taken by either side. It, may, it seems that maybe there's somewhat of a fragile ceasefire holding. However, the violence has continued. Uh, today, Friday the 7th, um, a mother and her two daughters were driving along 
a highway in the West Bank along the Jordan Valley. Um, they were shot at by a Palestinian terrorist who shot them from a distance. Um, the car careened off the road, landed in an embankment. Uh, the terrorist approached the car, shot um, a woman and her two young daughters at close range. Both daughters were killed instantly. Uh, the mother is currently clinging to life in critical condition at an Israeli hospital. Uh, also today, just a few hours before this taping, uh, another Palestinian terrorist um, conducted a shooting and car ramming attack in Tel Aviv along the promenade there, popular with tourists and, and residents of Tel Aviv, um, injuring four people, one of them seriously, before he was killed. Uh, today, even up on the Temple Mount, a sort of fragile um, peace holding. There were Friday prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, no violence, although about 15 Palestinian young men were arrested for waving Hamas flags and chanting um, incitements, as the Israeli security forces called it. Uh, this shows the, the growing influence of Hamas and other jihadist organizations, again, in the old city of Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. So obviously... Um, the whole situation on multiple fronts in, in Israel is continuing to escalate, both in the north and in the south, on the coast of Tel Aviv, in the West Bank, and in, in Jerusalem. The temperature continues to rise. So we would ask you to continue to pray for the people of Israel, um, also for the people of Lebanon and the Palestinian territories. Um, we, FAI has a home base in the Golan Heights, of Israel and is continuing to conduct our uh, bomb shelter campaign that we announced last May. Um, this is a campaign that seeks to renovate and build new bomb shelters for Israelis in the Northern Galilee region. And the reason for that campaign was made all too clear over the past three days. Um, despite a government program um, over the past few years to build bomb shelters in the Galilee, uh, there are still over 50,000 Israelis in the Galilee region that have no bomb shelter to run to in the event of rocket fire. And as many Israelis will tell you, including the ones that we know and love and work with, uh, it's only a matter of time until the big conflict breaks out between Israel and Hezbollah, in which case we're not talking about dozens or even hundreds of, of unguided rockets. We're talking about tens of thousands of rockets coming from southern Lebanon um, that are currently in Hezbollah's arsenal, many of them guided rockets, precision guided rockets that can hit Israeli population centers all over Israel. So um, please continue to pray and intercede for the peace of Jerusalem. And if you can, uh, please give to our ongoing bomb shelter campaign. Uh, you can do the same um, by going to, again, to our giving site faimission.givingfuel.com slash bomb dash shelter dash campaign. Again, that's up on the screen for you. Um, please give as we continue to help and needy Israeli communities and bring them and show, show them the love of Yeshua and bring them a much needed um, form of protection from the coming conflict. Palestinian uh, factions, as I mentioned, in southern Lebanon enjoy a, a certain degree of immunity um, and continue to operate there despite Israeli operations uh, to root them out. So the conflict continues. Um, so we'll continue to report as things continue to happen. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can follow the FAI wire on Twitter for daily, sometimes hourly updates when there's a crisis taking place, especially in our areas of operation. Uh, but before we end today, I wanna to just key in on a couple of what I think are important points from a spiritual and prophetic standpoint uh, in relationship to this ongoing conflict. Um, as I mentioned, um, this all began Wednesday uh, after the prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount has been the flashpoint of conflict um, uh, between Israelis and Palestinians now 
uh, since the Six-Day War of 1967. And we've seen even in recent years, even since the Oslo Accords, which is supposed to be a peace framework, um, that tension and that violence continue to escalate. And it's done so for several reasons that you could point out politically or economically or, or socio-culturally inside of, inside of Israel. But obviously um, here at FAI and most of our viewers know that the undercurrents driving these things are largely spiritual, largely in the heavenly realms. Uh, what we would refer to and what Isaiah would, would refer to um, as a controversy of Zion. As I mentioned earlier, um, this month is not only the month of Ramadan, but also uh, this week overlaps uh, Ramadan with Pesach or, or Passover. Um, recently, a group of Orthodox rabbis, Jewish rabbis in Israel, uh, petitioned the new conservative and religious Israeli government to conduct the Passover sacrifice or what's known as the Korban Pesach, uh, the slaughter of the lamb, up on the Temple Mount. Um, this request was ignored, uh, but it shows the growing boldness and the growing momentum that this movement, uh, this so-called temple movement, is gaining in Israeli society uh, for Jewish worship up on the Temple Mount. Uh, as I mentioned before, Israel took the, the Temple Mount and all of the old city of Jerusalem back in 1967 after the Six-Day War. Um, as part of the peace agreement of that war, Israel was given security control and political control over the Temple Mount. Uh, but a Jordanian Muslim cleric known as the Waqf was given religious control over the Temple Mount and allowed to dictate what, happened on top of the, uh, what happens on the Temple Mount religiously. Um, the Waqf soon after instituted a rule that um, the Temple Mount would be used exclusively for Muslim worship at the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, Jews and Christians since the 1960s and all other religious groups have not been allowed to perform any sort of religious observance on the, the Temple Mount. That includes praying or singing or chanting or bringing up religious objects or anything like that. And in fact, um, Jewish rabbis forbade the, um, through halakha or, or Jewish law, forbade Jewish people from going up onto the Temple Mount uh, in fear that they might step inadvertently on the spot where the Holy of Holies was constructed in one of the previous biblical temples. Uh, this was the case all the way up until the 1990s. Uh, during the time of the Oslo Accords, which President Bill Clinton brokered uh, with Yitzhak Rabin and uh, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat, uh, that set the framework for a future peace deal of the, uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which still hasn't happened over 30 years later. Um, at that time, the temple movement was very small and very fringy. Uh, just a few Orthodox rabbis were encouraging Jews to go up on the Temple Mount and uh, were calling for the resumption of Jewish worship on the Temple Mount, specifically the rebuilding of a third temple and the resumption of, of Levitical sacrifices on the Temple Mount. Um, in the intervening 30 years, uh, that movement has continued to gain momentum. Um, today, there are Jewish tours or tours of Jewish um, uh, visitors to the Temple Mount almost every day, um, except on certain days um, in which the Temple Mount is closed to everyone but Muslims. Um, they are still very controlled tours. Um, the, the Jewish participants have to enter through a certain gate. They have to be escorted by security, uh, security detail. Obviously, they have to uh, tour the Temple Mount walking around in a certain direction. They aren't allowed to even approach any Muslims or any Muslim uh, holy sites, uh, but yet there is a growing interest in Jews worshiping the Temple Mount, uh, uh, or visiting, I'm sorry, the Temple Mount, and also at the same time, a growing interest and um, allowance for Jewish worship at the, on the Temple Mount. Uh, technically, Jews are still not supposed to pray or chant or do anything on the Temple Mount that is spiritual or religious in any way. Um, 
And just several years ago, if they had attempted to do so, their security detail would have told them to stop, possibly escorted them off the Temple Mount and arrested them if, if um, they refused to do so. Um, today, that is changing. Um, just three years ago, I was up on the Temple Mount um, during one of my visits to Israel and, and observed a, a Jewish tour group at the time near the Dome of the Rock um, stop their tour and begin chanting in Hebrew, um, a liturgical chant, a, a religious chant. Uh, their security detail did not attempt to stop them from doing this. Uh, they were soon after surrounded by Palestinian detail, um, security detail that's employed by the Waqf. They are not armed, uh, but they do have cell phones, and they began recording this incident. It was actually a rather tense incident, um, and thankfully there was no altercations or, or anything that came out of it. Um, but it was just one example of uh, Israeli security's growing tolerance of and even encouragement of Jewish religious observance on the Temple Mount. So slowly, slowly, bit by bit by bit, it's becoming more normative for Jews to worship on the Temple Mount. Hence, uh, Hamas's and other radical clerics, Muslim clerics, uh, strong warnings against such a thing during Passover this year. Um, the temple movement today is much larger. It's still a minority, uh, but at one time, the Zionist movement, that was the, the movement to repatriate the Jewish homeland in Israel, uh, in the late 1800s was also a small movement, was a minority movement. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, as the Zionist um, movement gained steam with the Zionist World Congresses, that were fueled by the pogroms against Jewish people um, across Eastern Europe and, and Russia, and even in, in Western Europe, uh, that fueled Jewish immigration into the Holy Land, um, the Zionist movement gained steam until it became uh, normative across the Jewish diaspora, across the world, uh, for Jews to have their own homeland. And then obviously in the 1940s during World War II with the, with the Holocaust, um, was the final push, uh, provided the final impetus, the final push uh, for the British mandate to end and for the United Nations to recognize a sovereign Jewish state in 1947, which became a reality in 1948. So just as the Zionist movement gained steam over the course of about uh, 50, 60, 70 years in the late 19th, earliest 20th centuries, so now we see um, Jewish worship on the Temple Mount becoming normative in the decades since the Six-Day War. Uh, the Temple Institute, which is one of the main institutional arms of the Temple Movement, um, has an educational center, has uh, educational resources, um, has a museum in which it can, has contained all the Levitical garments and implements and tools that would be needed uh, for a third temple. Um, has construction materials prepared for a third temple, and even last year received a delivery of several um, red heifers from a certain uh, Texas cattle rancher that were declared to be unblemished according to the requirements of the Torah in the book of Numbers. Um, the Temple Institute exists. Its mission and purpose is to be ready to implement, re-implement Levitical sacrifices on the Temple Mount at any time. And it seems as Jewish worship on the Temple Mount becomes more and more normative, um, these groups in the Temple Movement are seeing their um, opportunity arise. So they petitioned again the Israeli government this year, hoping to be able to lead a, um, a Passover sacrifice on the Temple Mount. They've been doing it nearby in the Jewish uh, quarter of, of the Old City. Um, for the past several years, but have not been able to do it on the Temple Mount yet. Um, as I said, they were ignored. It, it didn't happen. But uh, nonetheless, the new Israeli government um, that took office last year, the cabinet that took office last year under uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, is the most conservative, the most right-wing, and the most religious, orthodox, and ultra-orthodox religious 
government in Israeli history. And so the more orthodox religious movements such as the temple movement really see this as the most friendly government to their aims and goals of reestablishing um, Jewish worship on the Temple Mount and hope to do so soon. Why is this important? Why is this significant? Well, obviously, if you track with FAI, you already know some of the reasons why. Um, at the beginning of the um, coronavirus pandemic in the spring of 2020, Dalton Thomas and Joel Richardson led a, a teaching series on the book of Daniel, specifically chapters 7 through 12, which um, detail Daniel's uh, prophecies and visions related to the end times. Um, specifically, Daniel sees several visions that relate to a figure who he calls the little horn, um, who we've identified in those teachings, and you can still go back and watch them. They're available on the app. Um, he ad identifies in those teachings and later is identified by, by New Testament teachers, including Jesus and the apostles, as being who we would call the Antichrist. Um, this, the rise of this little horn happens in conjunction with the resumption of the daily burnt offering on the Temple Mount. Um, this continues for a period of time in Daniel's narrative until the little horn intervenes and brings an end to the daily sacrifice on the Temple Mount in an event that's called the Abomination of Desolation. He and his armies desecrate. Um, the holy mountain and um, the temple or whatever structure may exist at that point may not be um, a stone, a brick and mortar temple, maybe something like a tent, we don't know, but there will be some kind of structure there and an altar there where um, uh, Jewish sacrifice is taking place. Jesus calls out this abomination of desolation in Matthew 24 in his Olivet Discourse as being the event, the marker event that we can uh, look for and see as the beginning of what he calls the Great Tribulation. That is the worst time of suffering for the Jewish people and also for the Gentile churches in the history of the world. So obviously the resumption of Jewish sacrifice on the Temple Mount is necessary in order for there to be um, an intervention by the Antichrist at the midpoint of the 70th week as described in Daniel chapter nine, um, and in order for the abomination of desolation to take place. So as we see things maybe inching in that direction over time as, as Jewish worship becomes more normative in Israeli society, especially from the standpoint of wanting there to be religious freedom for Jews and even Christians on the Temple Mount, um, we can expect to see this time, I think probably coming soon. Um, we don't know exactly what the catalyst will be uh, to allow for Jewish worship, um, open Jewish worship and Jewish sacrifice on the Temple Mount, maybe something like a war, uh, some kind of catastrophic, catastrophic event um, like the Holocaust. Um, could be a war with Iran, with Hezbollah, we don't know. We definitely see those kinds of conflicts coming in Israel's near future. Um, in closing, I'll just read to you a, a portion of Daniel chapter 8 so you can get a sense of how integral um, this is um, to the return of the Lord in the end of the age. Daniel chapter 8 is a conflict between two figures, uh, the ram that comes out of Persia and the uh, one horned goat that comes out of what is modern day Turkey. Um, it's out of the horns of the goat, the ten horns that grow up out of the one horn on the goat, that one little horn arises and subdues the rest. And uh, chapter 8, verses 9 through 14 say the following. Out of one of them, that is out of the ten horns of the goat, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. That is across the Mideast region, including Israel, the glorious land. It, the little horn, grew great, even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and even some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Describing not only uh, earthly trampling of nations, uh, but also in the heavenly realms. It, the little horn, became great, even as great as the prince of the host, which is debatable as to the identity of the prince of the host, 
could be whoever would be acting as a high priest of the um, Levitical system in place on the Temple Mount at that time. And the regular burnt offering, that is the Le Levitical daily burnt offering, was taken away. And the place of the sanctuary was overthrown. The sanctuary referring to the temple or the tent or whatever may exist at that time. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw, that is the little horn, will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one, Daniel's term for angelic beings. I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering and transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. So one angel asked another, how long is this going to be going on where there is the daily burnt offering, which leads to the abomination that causes desolation, which leads to this time of overthrowing of the saints, this great tribulation, until the rest restoration of the temple, which we know will come at the Lord's return. The, angel, the other angel answers, 2,300, 2,300 evenings and mornings, 2,300 days, about six and two-thirds years on the Gregorian calendar. So quite literally, whenever Jewish sacrifice, uh, ritual sacrifice resumes on the Temple Mount, the clock is literally, literally ticking down to the Lord's return. So this is, again, one of the important aspects of the end of the age for us to watch. Um, the gospel going out to every people group in the nations is, is the church's primary, uh, primary responsibility um, in this age and, and uh, the way that we can speed his coming. But as we see these events unfolding in the Middle East, the, the Jewish people regathered to the land, especially to, to Jerusalem. And as we see uh, the season of uh, the resumption of Jewish worship drawing near in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount, uh, we need to be watching and we need to be praying and uh, we need to be good Bereans studying the scripture, uh, the maskalim who are the wise ones who are able to guide the church and the Jewish people through the upcoming uh, tribulation time. So once again, uh, thank you for joining us. This has been a big update this week, but we wanted to tie all of the things happening in Israel back to what we know is the singular undercurrent of this, and that is the driving force uh, towards the end of the age and the day when our Lord splits the sky and rescues his people and establishes them and the kingdom forever. So we love you all. Thank you for your pr prayers and your encouragement. We will continue to pray for you. Uh, have a great Good Friday and quiet Saturday and Resurrection Sunday. Maranatha.